Hi everyone, this is Jim. This is a follow-up video to a recent video I did, a chess blitz game with live commentary. And uh, in that game I was uh, black playing against Jim Jacket and I played the Slav defense. We're going to start out, I'm going to take a look at the opening moves, uh, compare them to what's normal. And then uh, we'll play through the game and I'll point out a few tactical uh, possibilities that were missed along the way. Um, so, hope you enjoy. Let's see, let's get started. D4, my opponent played, and I played uh, D5 with the intention of playing the Slav defense. He went C4, which is uh, Queen's Gambit, and uh, the way to respond to the Queen's Gambit, the top three moves are C6, E6, and uh, D takes C4. Um, the Queen's Gambit accepted. The other two were declined variations. Um, and so C6 is known as a Slav. This database, by the way, comes from the Fritz 12 chess program. <clears throat> so let's see, I played c6, he played knight f3, and I went knight f6, those are the standard moves, and he went knight c3, and I went e6. So these are all pretty standard. You have a very solid uh, triangle here as black. Uh, you're going to bring your knight to here. You may take a pawn this way to relieve some of the pressure in the center later and open up with either um, c5 or e5. Uh, when appropriate, after preparation. <clears throat> okay, so my opponent plays the most challenging move, I think, uh, bishop g5. And I play h6, which is a way of asking the bishop what he's doing. And um, taking used to be a sort of automatic. The idea is you want to um, have a tempo to push the e-pawn so that this uh, pawn over here is protected. Um, if the bishop retreats, black can actually grab this pawn. But this is kind of an interesting line, and it's another way to play it, so I wanted to show you that. So let's take a look at what happens if the bishop retreats. It's a new variation. Black grabs the pawn, and then white pushes e4 right away. He's going to try and uh, take advantage of the pin on the knight, and also he's attacking this pawn. So one funny thing that black could do, well, first of all, he can just play... Uh, g5, that's that's the normal move, but let's show that. Bishop g3 and b5, and he's holding on to the pawn, and you might think, uh, isn't isn't uh, black just a pawn up? But if you look at his uh, structure here, it's kind of a mess. You know, the pawns are here and there. There are holes in it on the light squares around here, and uh, these pawns can be undermined. So uh, it's not so easy, and you see uh, white has a normal sort of opening advantage in this line, so um, he has adequate compensation for that uh, pawn. But there's another way of playing it which is kind of even more interesting, which is um, black is ambitious and he tries to protect the pawn right away. It seems like he's ignoring this threat to his knight. Um, but he has a move in mind. He's going to play g5 and block the bishop and then if the bishop moves away he's going to move the knight away and he's got an extra pawn. Um, and what's interesting is that white has this option here of knight takes g5. So it looks like a knight sack. In fact, it is a knight sack. But white is going to get the knight back because after you take, um, this pin is still on. It's uh, black's turn to move here, but he really doesn't have a great move. He's going to lose this knight either way. Okay, the book line is knight bd7. And then white can follow up and take this. So white actually has an extra pawn in this line because he picked up two pawns over here and lost one pawn on this side. Um, but it's an open position with chances for both sides. If you look at the statistics, um, you can see that uh, you know white has his usual opening advantage, but, but there's possibilities for black too. So just another way you can play this. Let's go back to the game. I just wanted to point that out. So in the move, in the game, he played bishop takes f6, and I don't need to look at the opening book anymore because I immediately make a terrible move here. The normal move, and I knew this at the time, is uh, queen takes uh, f6. You don't want to mess up your pawns for no reason. <coughs> and uh, and the game continues. It's a, it's a good game for both sides. Um, for some reason, you know, one of the reasons I started doing these uh, live blitz videos is I wanted to... Uh, try and uh, reduce the number of stupid mistakes I make in my games. I was hoping that uh, having to talk about the game while I'm playing it would cause me to stop and think at times, but I played this move without thinking, and this is a terrible move. Um, sometimes you can get away with something like this. You get uh, 
dynamic compensation for the uh, doubled pawns with an open file and uh, sometimes you'll get active squares for your pieces but that doesn't apply here because uh, the strategy I was using earlier in the opening was a very slow strategy of creating this pawn triangle which actually blocks in the bishop and uh, you can see I'm already behind in development he's got two pieces out and I have none and I can't uh, develop the bishop here uh, because it conflicts with uh, where I want to put the knight. So I'm going to have to move the knight here, get it out of the way, and then develop the bishop. So not only am I behind in development, but I'm going to be further behind. Um, so anyway, it's just a terrible opening blender. And uh, let's follow the game for a little bit. I'm going to turn on the uh, engine at this point, and I'll just point out a couple of uh, interesting tactics along the way. So... These moves are all pretty normal, just just trying to contest that center. I don't want to just roll over and let him have everything. So um, I kick the knight and get a perch for my knight. And uh, he castles. And uh, here I, I play one of my early inaccurate moves. Um, Peter really recommends uh, bishop g7 and castling kingside here. I was starting... To, I still had the idea at this point that I was going to be able to castle queenside, and it turns out... That's just not possible, especially after this move, Queen E2, which was a, a top Houdini recommendation. Really an excellent move here. Uh, pinning this pawn and threatening to play um, D5 immediately. Um, so I play Bishop E7 to uh, block the pin, but he can charge ahead with D5 anyway, and uh, he does. And we get to this position. And I was still um, <clears throat> thinking of castling queenside at this point, but he plays rook a c1, really another uh, good move. It really squashes the idea of castling queenside. The computer recommends I should go ahead and castle kingside at this point, and you can see that uh, white has achieved a substantial advantage uh, by his uh, better play so far. Um, and I... Um, had the wrong idea here. I was thinking maybe I would contest this file and um, maybe move my king to f7. But after rook c8, he follows up immediately with knight e5, another top computer move. And uh, his advantage has gone up again. Um, and the problem is uh, this f4 pawn, f5 pawn, is sort of hanging. Um, I was thinking during the game he could actually take it right here. Well, after my move. I was thinking perhaps he could take this. I can't take back because the knight can move with check and win my queen. But it turns out that if his bishop takes here, I can take the knight. And uh, so that's the, the way to play it, is the way he played it, which is first you eliminate the, the bishop. And now I can't take with the knight because, again, this pawn would be hanging, so I take with the king. And uh, here, if he follows up with rook fe1, the computer thinks that's really strong. For some reason, the move bishop b5 that he played uh, gives me a chance to regroup a little bit. So let's look at what would happen with rook fe1. New variation. He's threatening this, and knight e4 looks terrible. I was thinking of playing a rook move. Ah, I see the problem. <laughs> if I play a rook move, his bishop to b5 check then is much stronger because it skewers the queen king and uh, wins the exchange there. So rook to e8 is kind of a, a bad move. It showed up there briefly. Well, it shows knight a4 after rook h8. So I was going to play that. Yeah, bishop b5 check would win the... <clears throat> Bishop b5 check would win the exchange at least. But um, he, the computer recommends knight a4 here, attacking the queen. Let's see, queen to d8, and then bishop b5 check. Okay, so he's just throwing in an extra move to make my position slightly more awkward. So definitely rook f8, rook f e1 was a good move. And. Um, so rook h8 actually gives it now as one of my best tries. Other tries look like knight e4 is just terrible. He can just take it. <laughs> so 
<laughs> don't see the point of that. So instead of building up with rook fe1, what, he, what uh, my opponent actually played was bishop b5 check first. And then my king sidesteps the check, probably the only move. And now he doubles on this file. And now it gives bishop b4 as a move that I can play. Yeah, I had the same idea. I played bishop c5, but bishop b4 also pins the knight. But the idea is you move the bishop out of the way so the queen can defend the pawn. Now he goes um, rook c to d1. Uh, bishop d3, going back and attacking the f-pawn again. Looks like a strong idea here. Okay, but he plays rook c d1, and um, I oppose that rook. I was thinking about playing the knight here, and I realized um, I could get in trouble after his rook comes down and checks my king. Um, it also turns out, if we back up for a second, there's another flaw with this idea of knight uh, to g4. Maybe you want to take a second and see if you can see the one-move tactic that white has to refute knight g4. You can pause the video if you want to think about it. It's it's a, a, a neat and simple tactic. Yeah, I hope you saw that. If I play knight g4, he can play knight to e5 check, forking the king and queen, and I can't take it because this pawn is pinned. So I can't really move this knight away. and I need it to protect this square. And um, so I chose wisely to contest the rook this way as a trade. He attacks the pawn. Let's see, was there something better? Well, not much better. Okay. Yeah, he continues to attack my e6 pawn, and I, I bring my rook up to defend. Now the computer thinks that's not the best way to defend. Ah! Knight g4 is possible here. Why is that? Oh, knight g4 is possible now because the rook is guarding this square, and um, the knight is attacking this pawn. He can also win this pawn. So white retains an advantage after knight g4, but really knight g4 is the strongest move for black in this position. I pause to defend this uh, pawn here. He plays knight a4, which is also a nice move. It, um, I need both the queen and the rook to uh, defend this pawn here against all three attackers. Um, so when he chases the queen away, he's going to win this pawn. Um, but the queen is also defending the bishop, so I'm going to lose that pawn no matter what I do. I chose to play bishop takes f2. Maybe not the best continuation, but it's still playable. Well, queen c6 or queen a5. Yeah, so he's computer recommends just moving the queen, letting the knight take the bishop, and then giving up that pawn. Um, so rather than simply giving up the pawn, I decide to win a pawn and give up a piece instead. And uh, so it's probably not as good. But uh, when you're down, sometimes you want to get a position that's a little more unbalanced. So I have a, a position where I've got pawns versus a piece. is better than having an even position where I'm just down in material. Makes things a little more complicated and interesting. So knight g4 check the computer recommendation, but I played knight e4 check. That was sort of my idea when I went to this combination. I would get a good square for my knight. I thought centrally located would be better. And then um, get my rook active. It turns out this doesn't win any material because he can just defend. I was thinking I might pick up a piece there, but uh, that was shallow thinking. <clears throat> so now I started going after his pawns, and um, the one thing I have going for me at this point is that my opponent is starting to run low on time, and so his moves are not, not quite as precise. Um, and so he actually allows me some chances here. Now this is an interesting uh, point. There's a tactic here that I completely missed during the game, and after he plays a3 I, I could have uh, uh, taken advantage and maybe uh, gotten an even game at this point. And uh, what the idea is, um, if you look around the board, there is um, a loose piece. Actually, there's a couple loose pieces. Um, nobody's <laughs> three. <laughs> so uh, three, yeah, white has three. Okay, I can't, I take that back. The bishop is defending the rook, so that's not loose. But nobody is defending the bishop, and the knight only has one defender, and it's also attacked once. So that makes it loose in a sense. 
because uh, if you just bring one more attacker against it, it has to move. And also, you can also, the other idea is chasing away the defender also serves to attack that piece. So the tactical idea here is to play knight to e5, attacking the bishop. And the bishop has no square that it can go to to escape being taken that still defends the knight. So the bishop could uh, move away and I take the knight. If the knight moves, I can take the, the bishop. And the only square the knight could move to that defends the bishop uh, is under attack by the rook. So after knight e5, actually, uh, the computer recommends giving up the exchange here. And uh, then I would have a pawn and a rook for two pieces. So that would be uh, roughly an even game. I miss that idea, but that's a nice tactic to keep in mind. You know, you look around for the loose pieces. You look around for a piece that's under attack and only has one defender. See if you can disrupt that defender. Um, and uh, you can often win something that way. So the game continued for a while, and um, like I said, my opponent had to start moving quickly here because he was low on time. I also wasn't finding the best moves in every case. But um, let me back up. There was one more point here where he had an interesting idea. Yeah, it was g4. So during the game, he never activated uh, his kingside pawns. And if you look at this, um, white is ahead in material, but he still needs to find a way to convert it to a victory. And these pawns aren't really going anywhere on the queen side because they're, they're facing these pawns. Um, so really his, his hope lies with his kingside pawns and also with undermining my pawns. So the idea of g4 is that if I take it, he can just grab this pawn on e4 and... Um, my position sort of dissolves at that point. Uh, my pieces are all loose. So um, that, that's a good idea in a way to uh, proceed in this position. He, he was still thinking more about moving his pieces around to optimal squares and attacking my pieces. Um, I would have been better going back to e5 there. And now um, it's a little bit awkward since I went to the square where my knight was loose. He attacks it and I uh, didn't really see any great squares for it. If I move it, I'm losing this pawn here. So my reply is more or less forced. I attack his knight, we trade. And then he moves here, which is also not the best move. It allows me to uh, attack the bishop and uh, pick up another pawn. So uh, at this point, my opponent just uh, ran out of time and, and lost the game. And so that's how it ended. Um, you can see he still has an advantage here, um, even with uh, moving the uh, bishop and, and maybe losing a pawn here. But um, it was a hard-fought game, and um, you know things are complicated. You know they can, uh, people can make mistakes and time scrambles. So even though I was uh, in sort of a sad position from the opening, you saw there was one chance tactically I had to get back in the game that I missed. And uh, overall, it's just um, you keep you keep fighting till the end. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I'll be doing some more live blitz videos soon. And leave any comments you have in the uh, section below. Thanks. See you later.